Good morning, folks. How are you doing? Today is Friday. I believe it's the 12th day of January 2024. It's bright and early. What time is it? It's 7.30 in the morning. Uh, this is just a quick video. I'm going to put this out there and then I'm going to get back to doing some work on what happened uh, today, yesterday at the, uh, uh, at the uh, uh, International Court of Justice. I'm, I'm not jumping on this just because... Uh, this this interview that took place with uh, uh, Shannon Sharp and uh, between uh, Shannon Sharp and, and Cat Williams on his his podcast called Club Shay Shay uh, is uh, apparently has been rather popular online for the last week or so. Uh, I'm kind of late to the game. I I heard about when it when it first came out, and I like Cat Williams. I think he's very funny. His stand up is extremely funny. Um, but I'm not a huge uh, Shay Shay fan, Shannon Sharp fan. But I watched a little bit of it last night, and uh, I have to admit it was good. And it was good because uh, Shannon had the wherewithal as an interviewer, uh, or as he says, a conversationalist, to sit back, uh, to, to toss the red meat out there, and to let Cat be Cat. And... Uh, if you've ever watched a Cat uh, Williams uh, stand-up routine, uh, you'll know that that is. Uh, he's he said he was uh, he had been working on it since 2022 to get Cat signed up for this thing, and he and and the interview has broke the internet. It literally has. Um. So I'm not jumping on the on the bandwagon for clout, but I did want to say something about. Uh, the main message of what Cat Williams had to say, and the one that everybody's trying to, some, some certain people are trying to push back on, uh, Shannon Sharp himself. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, let me just show you this. I'm not going to show you the clip right this second, but I'll show you. I'll give you something to put in your head. This is Cat Williams, and he is on Club Shay Shay. And this is Shannon Sharp's uh, uh, podcast. Which, up until this point, was kind of popular. He had some big things, some big fucking interviews. Uh, getting 9 million and 7 million and 10 million uh, views, nothing like what this has done because of what this individual had to say. Now, let me just say this uh, right off the bat. Uh, Shannon Sharp himself has come out and said in another interview on his other on his podcast with somebody else, uh, Ocho Cinco, uh, Ocho, whatever he goes by now, he said that he keeps getting a bunch of people contacting him, big name people, saying, why didn't you push back on what he had to say? That's not an interview. You just let him rant. You just let him do a fucking stand-up routine for however long it was. And you should have pushed back. There is so much insight into what Shannon Sharp is saying when he tells you that. You should have pushed back. You got to push back when he says things like he said. Um... That tells you so much about our goddamn society we live in right there. Between that and what I'm about to play you right now, which is really what lit up um, the internet, why it, why it broke the internet. It wasn't just the, the, the stuff that he dropped about individuals and, and about uh, people stealing his fucking jokes from 1998 or some shit. <laughs> That's all interesting. Uh, but it's what he said in terms of the comedy industry not being a meritocracy. Uh, that really resonates with people out here. Because I'll tell you what, people in this country understand we are not by any stretch of the imagination a meritocracy at all at all if we were we would be in a much we'd live in a much better world the question is why and the other question is how far does this reach he's going to get he's going to start off with and this is a video i hope they don't fucking i'm going to put this on youtube and i hope fucking club shay shay let's i'm going to do 30 seconds of this cat williams uh thing <laughs> my videos are not monetized on youtube so this is not about money, but I want to I want to I want to 
dive into a little bit about what he's going to say about this one individual guy by the name of Kevin Hart. By the way, um, I've never watched a Kevin Hart routine that I thought was funny. Uh, I've never really, I don't, if I see Kevin Hart's name attached to a film, I'm not going to go watch the film because Kevin Hart's in it. I, I just never found him funny. You know, um, I didn't. I don't like, he just, he might be funny individually, personally. Some people are like that. Um, but th that doesn't translate to his stand-up or to the work that he does in front of cameras. Um, for me, at least. It might be different for other people. But we'll let that go for the moment. Let me, this is what he had to say. I'm going to play 30 seconds of this. I hope they don't claim enough to do. Case are on. In 15 years in Hollywood, no one in Hollywood has a memory of going to a sold-out Kevin Hart show. There being a line for him ever getting a standing ovation at any Why comedy club. He already had his deals when he got here. Have we heard of a comedian that came to L.A. and in his first year in L.A. he had his own sitcom on network television. I he's and he's getting defensive. He called Soul Plane that he was leading. No, we've never heard of that before that person or since that person. What do you think a plant is? What do you think a plant is? And that is at the core. That is why that bit of truth. And there's a bunch I'd recommend. I've watched. I haven't seen the whole thing, but I've, what I've seen, I would strongly recommend. And Shannon does a great job with the interview. Like I said, at times, he does a little pushback. But he's, you're not going to argue, first of all, with Cat Williams, because Cat Williams, he knows what he's talking about. Now, it's coming from his perspective, but he has a unique perspective. He's been in the industry. He's been doing the work for quite some time. And he got this through his own merits. He did the work on stage as a fucking stand-up comedian. He did the fucking routines. He went out there and he bombed. He went out there and he killed. <laughs> he developed his fucking craft, which is something that a lot of these people nowadays, a lot of these entertainers who are fucking handed to us on a silver platter, who are all of a sudden risen up out of nowhere, um, they didn't do. And it shows but they keep acting as if this is the greatest stuff ever. Here you go. This is for you. There's so many, there's so many avenues to talk about with this one message, this one small fucking part of this interview. There's a lot of others. But there's one, there's so many avenues to talk about with this. Before I forget it, I do want to toss this out there. What he's talking about, and I think the reason it resonates so well, is that it's, this is not limited to Hollywood or the uh, comedy industry or even hip-hop and rap, uh, which, of course, the same thing holds true for all of these industries, um, certainly with Hollywood. I mean, the Nepo babies just run rampant through Hollywood. And that's why, one of the reasons, that and the wokeness thing, but that's kind of dying down. But for the longest time, there's this talent drain, this, brain, this, this skill drain, this brain drain uh, taking place in Hollywood because it's just, okay, well, you know, you've made, I, I've made X amount of dollars for this fucking uh, studio. You're going to give my son and my daughter fucking jobs and big time jobs and important fucking jobs and they don't deserve it. But this is what nepotism does. It just slowly fucking, it slowly disintegrates like a cancer. It eats away uh, at, the, at whatever, whatever industry it finds itself in. And of course, Hollywood is, is absolutely that. I mean, how many fucking Nepo babies are out there headlining fucking films and they suck? They're horrible to fucking watch. And yet they keep getting fucking cast. They keep getting fucking contracts. They keep getting fucking deals. How many are producers now and directors now? How many wives and, 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 
and nephews and it's it's just dumbing down the fucking industry. That's why I tell you right now, one of the best the, the, the best film of the year that I've seen from last year, or I haven't seen it yet, but in terms of all the reviews I've read and all the people talking about it, was made in fucking Japan. Was it South Korea? Is it Japan or South Korea? It's fucking Godzilla minus one. <laughs> nothing nothing we do can even compare to it. A Godzilla movie out of Japan should win the fucking Academy Awards, should win the fucking Golden Globes, whatever the hell else. <laughs> we'll see what happens. But because we don't have the people to fucking to, to, to compete. And why? Because talented, skilled, dedicated, gifted people are not rising up. And that's what he's talking about. Because these sellouts... These plants, in the case of nepotism, the fucking family lineage, they're taking their fucking places. And there's only so many fucking places up there. Aunt <laughs> Bibi. When I saw this, I thought about Aunt Bibi. Something Aunt Bibi's been on for a while on Twitter. And she talks about this. She says, you know, why do all of a sudden these people just pop up in the alt-left community, which is what she's involved in? in terms of journalism and alt-left media. Why, where do they just pop up out of nowhere? Why do they just keep popping up out of nowhere? And they're affiliated with Max Blumenthal. Same thing happens on the right, in the alt-right, by the way, and they're affiliated with Steve Bannon. Why is this? He talks about, what he's going to what he talked about in this was there's this network. In, in one network, he explains the Steve Harvey network with all these guys. But there are these networks that have the power. He talked about Joe Rogan and his network. These networks that have the power to raise up people out of nowhere to pick them up, not based on the merits of their work, not based on the merits of their fucking skill or their talent or their passion, but to pick them up because they are malleable, because they are controllable, to pick them up and to push them out there and offer them up as if they're some kind of uh, skilled comedians who deserve the fucking attention. They're not. They are people who will only go so far. What I'm BB's talking about is very true. There are networks within the alternative media uh, on both sides. There's one fucking network around Steve Bannon. There's one fucking network around fucking Max Blumenthal. There are others. And you have to supplicate yourself. You have to uh, kiss the ring, so to speak. And you have to promise you're only going to go so far. You're only going to say certain things. You're not going to go too far. What happened? I'll give you an example. So you know I'm not full of shit. Ben Norton was a was a was a was a was a hanger on but he was also one of the early Max Blumenthal network uh, signees if you would <laughs> and they had a recent falling out and they were screaming back and forth at each other on a bus in Nicaragua some people had thought it was staged when I saw it I said that's not staged no 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 that's not something something's happening here <laughs> Max Blumenthal was pissed at Ben Norton because Ben Norton wasn't shitting on China, 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 blaming. And that's so important for him because his fucking... Max Blumenthal's daddy is a perfect example. Max Blumenthal's daddy is Sidney fucking Blumenthal. He's a hatchet man for the Clintons. <coughs> Has been his whole life. He's an insider's insider. That network is being run by his son. Who's the scumbag? Max Blumenthal. So Blumenthal is yelling at his best buddy, Ben Norton. <coughs> ben Norton was down there to run his, to, to try to manage and tamp down the activities in Nicaragua, or at least be able to keep, keep up with what's going on with the... Uh, with the organizations on the outsides and the outskirts in Nicaragua and report back to fucking Blumenthal, who of course reports back to Sydney, who reports of course to 
uh, the National Endowment for Democracy or USAID or whoever the fuck else it is. Looking for ends, looking for people, for weaknesses. That's what they do. Well, they had a falling out. What happened? Ben Norton says, fuck you. He's gone. He was embarrassed. Max Blumenthal called him out, said he was stealing money, said he was a fucking fraud in that bus with a bunch of activists, the kinds of people that he was there for Max Blumenthal to keep tabs on. Do you understand? He had pushed beyond that fucking boundary. That's all it was. He didn't steal no fucking money. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't hit on his girlfriend. He didn't do any fucking pedo stuff. Even though the girl he was with looked mighty fucking young. He had stepped out of fucking bounds and wouldn't come back. And so, of course, Max Blumenthal, with a camera, decided he was going to call him out in front of the people he was supposed to be, who were supposed to be his colleagues, to make it impossible for him to continue to work there. And he, it, he did. It worked successfully. Max, uh, ben Norton then had to go to, to China, drop a bunch of his, drop his, his the stuff that he had done with Max Blumenthal, dump that off offline, and then go back to start going back to school to get his fucking PhD or something so he can he can he can have a different career. That's what I'm saying. He was a. They bring him up like this as plants. He's absolutely right. Cat Williams is absolutely right. <laughs> they bring them up as plants because they can be controlled. Now, you ask yourself, you say, Scott, what are you talking about? I'll give you another example before I talk about this. I've made this, I've told this story for over a decade. I'm going to tell it one more time. I'm not going to say it's the last time. I'll say one more time. <laughs> a long time ago, and it is a long time ago now, nearly 20 years. In 2005, when I came to understand what happened on September 11th, 2001, and I got involved heavily in the truth movement. <laughs> For a couple of years, I was involved in a 9-11 meetup group down here, and there was one individual who led it, who was really the head of the truth, mo truth movement down here uh, uh, in Tampa. She was... Um, I'm not going to mention names, but she was uh, rising in popularity in the truth movement. She wasn't a writer. She wasn't fucking David Ray Griffin. She was, but she was personable. She did a bunch of interviews. She was putting herself out there, and she was all in on it. She was actually going up to back in the day when they were walking. When they would do, they do marches or street actions. Remember that big fucking display they had with was the 9/11 uh, uh, Commission's fucking book on the uh, what happened, what really happened in 9/11. That that dumb fucking thing. They, they report the the 9/11 report with the big holes punched through it. Uh, that back in those days, she went up to fucking Boston, did the Tea Party thing they did up there. That's where the Tea Party started, by the way, was in the Truth Movement. It wasn't what the Tea Party is associated with now. That's where it started back in those days. But anyway. So she was getting out and she was doing interviews and she did an interview, I think an a national interview with NPR someplace or a debate on NPR. She used to do fucking public access stuff down here. She was getting a lot of attention. Katrina happens. And <laughs> she gets a contract building these stupid styrofoam temporary houses for people in the outskirts of, of uh, uh, New Orleans down there from FEMA. She was a subcontractor from a subcontractor from the subcontractor from that guy who stole a bunch of fucking money and ran off and disappeared. She got that FEMA fucking contract money. And then she started in with at the truth meetings the meetups which we were doing once a week and we do street actions and shit like that then she started pushing this shit on ray beams from space and judy wood and 
uh, no planes and no all this dumb shit. And we're sitting, I'm sitting watching her. She got involved in this flake doctor who had this um, process to remove toxins from your blood. And basically what it was is they had this stupid fucking microscope and uh, you could buy into this gimmick. Uh, a stupid microscope. Uh, you take a picky, pick of your blood like, the, like I do for my testing, which I do today, by the way. Put it on a fucking, you know, slide. Uh, and slide it in the, in the microscope. And then the microscope would plug into the computer. And she'd pull up the computer, this file, and there's this fucking blood. And you'd see, like, I mean, like, old dirty socks in the blood. And you'd see, like, you know, skull and crossbones shit. It's like, oh, my God, look at all the toxins you got. It's moving around. Here, take this and then come back in two weeks and, I'll, and we'll do it again. And I'll show you how it cleans your toxins. She tried that shit with me. Now, I did some drafting for her just because I didn't, the, the styro, stupid styrofoam houses thing. So I did some drafting for her for, for two presentations, not for stuff to be actually done and built in. in but this was, you know. <sighs> I came back to drop off some drawings and she's like, you want to do this? She tried it with me. I'm just looking at her. Because I can tell. It's, it's, it's a fucking file of a video of blood in a fucking, uh, under a microscope. That's not the same shit. You, I can take the fucking slide and kick it off the fucking microscope and the blood's still going to be there in the fucking, because it's a video. And God knows what the fuck she would, was trying to fucking sell me for like 60 bucks or some shit snake oil <coughs> and she'd have another file sitting right next to it and she when she came back two weeks later there'd be the file and it'd be clean and it'd be like a disney fucking sidewalk it was such a stupid fucking gimmick and it was an obvious gimmick it was a it was a usb thing that was jammed into the underside of the fucking microscope and shoved into the fucking computer as if it was doing anything it was such a gimmick. I just looked at her. And I was like, okay. This was the thing with the guy, the, the, the contractor, uh, the subcontractor, the subcontractor's contractor, her uh, boss basically ends up leaving. The whole thing goes to shit and fucking, and, and, uh, and after Karina, the, the post Karina shit goes to shit because everyone's just trying to steal the money, steal the money, steal the money. But she got FEMA fucking money, and I always wondered about that. So she tells me, she calls me and tells me she's gonna leave the country. She's going with this doctor on some contract to this fucking, these, these African nations to push this fucking snake oil under some NGO, the cover of some NGO. Now, if you understand what an NGO does uh, in African nations, like I understand what an NGO does in African nations, then you know she is a total fucking sellout at this point. And it was the FEMA money that got her. But then I put two and two together. Along comes the FEMA money. She gets that fucking contract. And all of a sudden, she's getting more attention in the truth movement. But she's pushing this stupid shit, this disinformation. She took me aside. We were getting coffee. The last time I was going to see her. And we're sitting there having our coffee. And I'm getting ready to get in my car and she's in her car. And she goes, Scott, I just want to tell you, whenever anybody rises to a certain level of visibility, don't trust them. I was told that Nine months after fucking Katrina. And off she went. And that stuck with me. And I've always tried to share that story with people. Why, why, why is the Cat Williams interview resonating so much? 
because we know the networks and networks and networks that control everything that determine how far up the fucking corporate ladder you're going to rise. They are all there for a reason. They are all there in order to maintain control. That's what they did with the 9-11 Truth Movement. That's what they did with the alt-media on both the left and the right. <laughs> That's what they do with Hollywood. That's what they do with producers. That's what they do with fucking politicians. Where did AOC come from? She was just all of a sudden risen up from her bartending job just to go from the Bronx. And I looked at that video before even her fucking primary. I understood what she was. Nobody else did. Few people did. Jimmy Dore certainly didn't. The Young Turks certainly didn't. They promoted her because they're also part of the fucking network. Then they can come back later and go, oh, oh, we, we knew all along she wasn't going to. Bullshit. They promoted her to get her in power. What, how did she just come out of nowhere like Kevin Hart did? How did she come out of nowhere? Just a girl from the Bronx. She wasn't from the Bronx. She was from one of the wealthiest goddamn suburbs in the entire fucking country. She happened to have, uh, her, her family happened to own an apartment in the Bronx. And so she stayed there while she was bartending at a place where she was probably making six, $700 a day down in Wall Street, this fucking clicky taco bar thing. <laughs> But they rose her up. Why? Why did they rise her up? Why, why, was she, why was she pulled up and promoted as something that she clearly wasn't? I told people before the fucking primaries, while Jimmy Dore and, and, and the Young Turks and everybody was saying, oh, she's awesome. She's going to really shake up the system. I said, she went to Boston University. She majored in neoliberal economic ideology. She got a business degree, an economics degree. The only thing they teach there is neoliberal economic ideology. And she was a favorite of the professors. She also got a minor in international studies. What does that make her? A neoliberal globalist. That's exactly what that made her. And that's what I told people. No one listened to me. Turns out that's what she is. But here's the real kicker. The way we were all introduced to her was this slick ass, you know, oh, girl from the Bronx thing with her getting wearing blue jeans and getting on a subway. But I noticed when I saw it, it was so goddamn slick and it was so emotional. It played to all and it clicked all the right boxes. I said, that's professional. That's not some fucking nobody from the, some bartender. People who knew what the fuck that turns out, four different executives from all these fucking K Street, all these fucking uh, uh, top advertising firms took time off to make that fucking thing for her. Why? Out of nowhere, they just saw this fucking bartender and said, hey, we're going to get behind her. No. They went and found her. They were working for Nancy Pelosi. Why? <laughs> because the guy she quote unquote beat, which she didn't beat, but the guy she beat in that uh, area in the Bronx, in that fucking district in the Bronx, was the third most powerful Democrat in the House of Representatives. And he had promised to unseat Nancy Pelosi as Speaker of the House when he won, we, we, he won his re-election, which was a fucking given. They stole that election, and they picked her up and used her as a plant to do it, to get rid of somebody who at one time had been in favor but had fallen out of favor. And that's what happens. That's what happens. This is not a meritocracy. People can argue it never has been. Well, if you, if you like. But that's the political side of it. Now, to get back to Cat Williams, again, I've seen almost all the, the, the interview. 
<laughs> I don't know enough about the industry to tell you whether or not everything that he had to say was was 100% accurate or not. My guess is it's pretty fucking close. Well, at least it's accurate in terms of his perspective. But I will tell you this. The people who are brought up now, the people who are in the network are safe. They're safe. What don't they want? Every industry is controlled now. They don't want anybody, especially anything in entertainment. It's all got to be controlled. We don't want someone stepping out, like Cat Williams, for instance. That's why it was so refreshing to see and why it was so fucking popular. Because the alternative, first of all, they aren't funny. They're not skilled. They're not talented. But they're safe. They're safe. They're never going to step outside of the fucking box. Comedy has been historically in this country, or at least in the last that I know of. I don't know what happened, what, what comedy scene was like in the 1850s. <laughs> but I can tell you. I mean, look at the Here's a, here's a, here's a list. It's a partial list. Of the kinds of comedians they don't ever want to see rise in popularity to the point where their message resonates to the rest of the fucking population. Red Fox, Lenny Bruce, George Carlin, Bill Hicks, Richard Pryor, Bernie Mac, and of course, Cat Williams. Now, Cat does less political stuff in his town. I mean, maybe he does more now. I don't know, but... <laughs> he does less political stuff in his stand-up. <clears throat> but you understand my point. Now he's certainly telling the truth, and now he's certainly way out on that list. And he's not one of these sycophants. He's not going to fucking wear, be a, a black comedian wearing a fucking dress. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me add this num this this one. This is an obvious one that I should have had on there uh, from the start. Dave Chappelle. My apologies to Mr. Chappelle. They don't want someone coming up like these individuals did. Some people coming up and making political commentary in their fucking comedy. People can make fucking milk toast bullshit political commentary all day long, and they do. You know. He can have you can have fucking you can have that jackass on television dancing around with the fucking with the dancers dressed up as fucking uh, uh, hypodermic needles. I forget that piece of shit's fucking name. Corbert, Steve, Steve, Steve whatever, whatever the fucking dickhead's name is, dancing around, uh, singing the you know go out and get your vaccine shit. That's what they want. That's what they reward. That's what they promote. People who are safe. People who will do what they are told. They want that in industry. They want that in politics. They want that in the alt media. They want that in the, in the mainstream media. They want that in fucking Hollywood. They want that in music. And they want that in fucking comedy. So to that end, I, I, I certainly, I applaud Cat Williams. And uh, I guess... By uh, by association, I have to give Shannon Sharp his props as well, because he he knew enough to you know remain quiet to let it go. He was you could see him cringing, you could see him you know he's the first getting his you can see where in that video I showed you his arms just folds his arms he crosses his arms and it's just he's getting defensive because he knows this shit's gonna, he was joking later he's like oh my god I'm never gonna be able to fucking get anybody for an interview, and like I said. Let's, let's wrap it all back up where we started. What did he say in his, in his discussion later the next day with Ocho, Ocho Cinco? Chad Ocho Cinco was, uh, he changed his name to Ocho Cinco, was a great fucking wide receiver. Uh, uh, and he does a podcast with Shannon Sharp, who, by the way, is also a Hall of Fame football player. Um, but what did he say? All these establishment folks are, 
contact, he didn't use the word, the phrase establishment. He said, all these people are just contacting me. Saying, why didn't you push back? Why didn't you stop? Why didn't you stop them? Why didn't you push back? Why didn't you shut them up? Is what they're asking. Because that's what they expect. They expect that from somebody who is controlled. Not that Shannon's controlled. I'm saying they expect that from a journalist. They expect that everywhere now. There's certain things you can say and certain things you can't. It's like the other day I talked about the thing with, uh, with uh, that jackass Aaron Rodgers and what he had to say. And I told you, he, what he was saying about the vaccines and about specifically ivermectin and, and hydroxychloroquine were absolutely 100% correct. He, he wasn't, wasn't complete, not only did they want to keep the emergency use, author, emergency use authorization in place so that they could justify dropping the fucking mRNA shots on people without being fully tested, which is what was very important there. Not only that, but they also understood those things worked and it would have killed off their fucking, it would have killed off their fucking golden goose, which was COVID-19. So he didn't go that far. Should have, but he didn't. But still, he was right. And the and the pushback on fucking Pat McAfee was, why didn't you fucking push back on him? Why didn't you call him out? Why didn't you stop that? Why didn't you not let him say these words? Words are dangerous. Words are, are, are violence. Well, I guess if you run a fucking corrupt system and comedians or athletes, or alternative journalists spend their time exposing your corrupt fucking system, I guess to them, yeah, words are violence. Because it threatens their control. Long time ago, someone told me what Cat Williams... Ex and, you know, I, I guess I kind of had the inclining... Uh, but a long time ago, somebody from first-hand experience, before she went off to do some NGO work in Africa, whatever the fuck they had her doing. But she told me what Cat Williams told the country a couple days ago. And that was, this is not a meritocracy. And there are networks and corruption throughout almost every single industry in most of the aspects of our lives. The more we see it, the more it's exposed, the more it's threatened. So, tip of the hat to Cat Williams, tip of the hat to fucking Shannon Sharp. Um, I just wanted to share that with you. Um, because it is an important message, what he said. Uh, and folks should, if they haven't seen it yet, I'm post a link to that one video I showed you down below. Go take a look at it. Anyway, after this, we're back to talking about what's going on in Gaza and more specifically what's going on at the International Court of Justice. Thank you for your time. Bye-bye.